That was a story of faith over fear and triumph over tyranny. And that led me to um, this book because I interviewed a family that had survived terrible torture, but they still came out with a smile on the other side. They couldn't tell me as victims why they were persecuted so badly. Why does the regime do what they do? So that's when I thought, as a journalist, I can't just put out this documentary without finding out, hearing from the perpetrators. So then I went and found them. Uh, I get to talk about interesting things on this program with interesting people. Uh, you've heard me um, over the months and years express my concern um, for w what people suffer uh, in communist countries like China specifically uh, and how some of those uh, Marxist ideas have infiltrated uh, America. And uh, I thought it would be uh, good for all of us uh, if I could get as my guest uh, Kay Rubicek, who is an author, a filmmaker, a journalist who's written on these subjects and has a book out called Who Are America? I'm sorry, Who Are China's Walking Dead, a personal journey into the strange world of communist culture and officialdom. Kay Rubicek. Am I saying that correctly? You are saying that correctly. Oh. And it's not America's Walking Dead yet, but it's where we would be if, if, if yeah, we that was a semi, let it go that was too a far. Semi-Freudian exactly. slip. Who are yes. China's Walking Dead? Well, what is your story? How do you come uh, to be writing about the horrors of, of communist China. Um, but you, you grew up, I can tell from your accent in Australia. Yeah, correct. Born and raised in a, what was at the time, a wonderful free land. And, uh, but my family actually escaped communism from three countries over three generations. First in the 1920s in Russia under the Soviet communism. And then my father was born and raised in China. Communism took over there and he had to escape during the so-called great famine that killed 45 million people. And, my husband, he uh, escaped former Czechoslovakia under the Eastern European bloc before the Berlin Wall fell. But the thing is, I was never taught about communism. We're not really taught about the crimes of communism in school. So even growing up under this, with this history, I, I didn't have access to that information. So it was really only when I became a human, a bit of a human rights activist and I went to China and uh, stood up for persecution over there and I spent a day in a Chinese prison that I really came face to face with like the regime. And they told me, I held a banner on Tiananmen Square, you know, this, in the center of Beijing, I had one word on it when I was being rounded up by the police, compassion. I was arrested for holding the word compassion and they told me that's illegal in China. And that made me really start to question. What, what year was this that you were over there? 2001. Okay. So, uh, about 20 years ago, yeah. you were still living in Australia. Were you married by that time? No, I'm married in 2002. What led you in your life uh, to find yourself in, in 2001 in Tenement Square holding up a banner that says compassion? Well, I had been... I'd been kind of sheltered from what communism was. And then when I, I started... Um, in 1999, there was a, another persecution. So in China, there's been persecutions. The Communist Party regularly persecutes every 10 years or so. Christians have been persecuted nonstop. Faith has been persecuted nonstop. And 1999 was the latest one against the Falun Gong meditation group. I'd been doing that, those exercises for a few years. And then suddenly they're rounding them up and, and killing people for doing this, which to me is nonsense. How on earth can they do something like this? And so I needed to see it for myself. I heard that there was some Americans, actually, the first Americans that I met. I met on Tiananmen Square and Caucasians said, we're going to appeal. Will you come? Oh, well, anyone wants to come. So I came. I, met, I went on that day with a friend and I, I, it, just, it just blew my mind to think that I could be arrested for holding the word compassion. On Tiananmen well, Square. I mean, again, we we have to be clear, folks. Um, when if you grow up in a place uh, like Australia or the United States of mm -hmm. America, you you probably have no idea how evil things can be in other parts of the world, or or what others have suffered or are suffering while you're going about your life. You know, uh, concerned about finding parking a parking space. 
And the fact is that there are many people living today who've experienced this. Uh, some of them experienced it today, but my parents experienced this. My mother grew up in Nazi Germany, which became Stalin's East Germany. My father grew up during the war. He saw the communists trying to take over in Greece. In your family, obviously, the Bolshevik Revolution nightmare. Uh, your husband grew up in Hungary. Anybody who was in Hungary in the 50s, I mean, this is the kind of thing, uh, or was it the 60s? I always get confused when uh, was it was a 56 or 68. But the point is that people who have experienced this evil know that it can happen again. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons I want to have you on is because there, there are many people today who don't, for some reason, they think we're past this. And not only are we not past it, but because we've been fooled into thinking we're past it, we are going dramatically in that direction. And, you know, you talk about uh, Christians being persecuted in China. Folks, it's not about Christians. It's about anything that dares to stand against the secular atheist state. So Falun Gong, the Uyghur Muslims, horribly persecuted because they stand against the atheism of the communist government. But you, so you tasted this for the first time. You're a young woman. You go there. You hold up a banner in Tenement Square and you're arrested. Yeah. Beaten and thrown into a basement prison cell. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I missed that part. They actually <laughs> laid a hand on you. Oh, yeah. I came back with bruises. Others, I wasn't beaten too badly. I had a bit of hair pulled out. I was bruised. Um, I witnessed my friend had his, his finger broken, nose bloodied. Um, if, if they get you on your own that's when the abuse is very serious. Um, I, I refuse to go on my own. The, the interrogation, witnessing their style of propaganda really set me on this journey to understand why they, the, the police themselves were so brainwashed. They, they told me that the CIA paid for my ticket and they were trying to make me sign papers to agree that the CIA had paid for my ticket. I, I, what are you talking about? I'm an Australian citizen. They they tried to make me pay for a return flight. I already had a return flight. But you know what it also showed me? The treatment they gave me was was abhorrent. It was it was terrible. But what I what I saw is that really tyranny is vulnerable. They were so afraid of truth being shown that they had to get me and others on planes and out of there as quickly as possible. So what what I really learned, you know, I went there with absolute naivety at the time. But I learned, you know, my family had run away from communism and I naively went face to face with it. And I learned that if we can stand up for the truth and stand up for our values, we have the absolute power in that. They are vulnerable because it's a system built on lies. And then we, it, start, it really started to help me understand what I was seeing here because I have children and what I started seeing in the school system in the U.S., um, I, I started thinking, this is what we've seen in history, and it's coming here. And that's when I started to dig into, well, let's look at China as the worst case scenario of where we could be if we allow it. And that's what led to the publishing of this book. So you also did a documentary for the Epoch Times. Is it the same title as the book? No, I've, I've made many documentaries. I did a series for Epoch Times last year called Life and Times. And they also have my latest documentary, Finding Courage, on their platform as well, Epoch TV. And that was a story of faith over fear and triumph over tyranny. And that led me to um, this book because I interviewed a family that had survived terrible torture, but they still came out with a smile on the other side. They couldn't tell me as victims why they were persecuted so badly. It, why does the regime do what they do? So that's when I thought as a journalist, I can't just put out this documentary without finding out, hearing from the perpetrators. So then I went and found them. Just to be clear, folks, there are companies that you probably give a lot of money to that are doing business with the communist Chinese. So this is on us. We have a responsibility to understand what's going on and what we can do about it. Uh, Epoch uh, Times, Epoch TV, they've been heroes uh, in this. Uh, and now I'm privileged to speak with Kay Rubicek. Uh, so the book, uh, l let me ask the question then, which is the question of your title, Who Are China's Walking Dead? What does that mean? So I interviewed former Chinese Communist Party officials, dozens of them. I've interviewed more than 100 survivors of communist tyranny, a lot from China. But the officials that have high-ranking officials, it's not easy to get them on camera. Many of them I couldn't get on camera. 
But what they told me very early on, one of them said to me, he was a former uh, police commissioner. He was there on one of the, there in the Ministry of Public Security on the evening of Tiananmen Square, uh, 1989, June 4th, when the 10,000 students were killed by tanks and the soldiers. He was there, one of the ones pushing the button, sending the soldiers out onto the square. And he told me, we are, we live like walking corpses, soulless bodies, walking flesh. And I had to stop the translator at that point because I had simultaneous translation coming in because he was talking to me in Chinese. I said, hold on, I, I don't understand this term and I don't like it. Please explain. And um, so she was trying to explain to me. I said, can I say the word walking dead? She said, yes. And I thought, okay, well, at least I understand that. I don't like it, but I understand that. And I then started, when I continued with my interviews with army colonel, judges, propaganda officials, secret agents, I asked them, have you heard of this term? Okay, when we come back, we will talk more with the author of Who Are China's Walking Dead? <music> Folks, I'm talking uh, to the author of Who Are China's Walking Dead? A Personal Journey into the Strange World of Communist Culture and Officialdom. Kay Rubicek is an author, award-winning filmmaker, journalist. You were just talking about where you first heard the term Walking Dead. So you said you were talking to one of the officials who was behind the Tenement Square massacre in 1989, one of the men who allowed these murders to take place or who perpetrated the murders. An operator. He was a police chief and... And he had to follow those. He felt that he had to follow those orders. Right. Well, of course, this is this is what these cultures are like. There, it's kind of like being in hell, and you've got bigger demons telling the smaller demons, "If you don't do this, we will torture you." And so it's it is so wicked and horrifying. But you're saying that this man, uh, who was at least in part responsible for these murders, himself was dead inside, and he admitted this to you uh, as he's speaking to you that his soul has been crushed. And and he not only that, there were so many concepts that come from this communist ideology. He told me that he called his daughter that night and said, go out and watch the killing because they lived in Beijing. They were very close to Tiananmen Square. I'm a mother and, and I, I'm like, why? Why did you do that? He's looking at me as if to say, what's wrong with, why don't I understand? Um, and he, he said, well, Lenin says this, this, and he's quoting Lenin to explain this is what happens when you really are consumed. You, you, your faith is replaced by the, the faith of the state of communism, um, that ideology. And so he told his daughter to go and watch because he, he knew that the propaganda would kick into effect the very next day, which it did to say that the students were killing soldiers on the square. He wanted his daughter to see it with her eyes. So he still had enough heart at that time to want to protect his daughter from the lies. Correct. And even if it meant seeing the slaughter. It's unbelievable. You said 10,000 were killed. I forgot that. Yeah. And this is what happens in history, right? And now this happened in my lifetime. I remember Tenement Square. I remember as it was unfolding that, um, and, and Americans need to hear this, that the people in China who were standing against the wickedness, the evil of the communist state created, built a Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty means that much to them, meant that much to them that they created this Statue of Liberty. They built it because they're looking to places like America where we are free, but usually don't appreciate it or, or fight for it. Th this was this this holy token to them. And so obviously they were making so much progress in a sense by, by these protests that the Chinese Communist Party made this ultimate decision to just murder them, just to crush them and to try to lie to the world about what actually happened. So you're saying that even this police chief knew that the next day they would say, the violence was instigated by the students. Yes, yes. And I have a chapter in my book where I analyze the propaganda put out by the state about this. They call it, they use, they use euphemisms, a political incident. 
So w in China, they just say that political incident in 1989. They don't refer to it as a massacre. Like the great famine that my father survived where 45 million people killed. There's nothing great about it at all other than 45 million people killed due to socialist policies. So it's, they had, they held a show memorial. And this just wasn't propaganda. It was propaganda, but they actually, it happened. It wasn't just shown on TV. They had thousands of youth, children, as well as soldiers on Tiananmen Square. And they had a, a massive show mem memorial. And it wasn't for the soldiers that were, for, it wasn't for the students that were killed. It wasn't for the 10,000 innocent citizens killed. It was for a few soldiers. I'm fascinated, um, Kay, that you were there uh, in Tenement Square. And again, this was only what, 12 years after this event happened, but, uh, that I guess people go there to, to protest. Now, when you went there, did you have any idea that there would be a crackdown on you? It hadn't happened before for Caucasians holding a banner like this. So they didn't know what to do with us, but within 30 seconds, within 30 seconds of the banner going up, I was surrounded by police. 30 seconds. And that's you were an Australian it. citizen at the yes. time. Yes, and that's why I couldn't have been held longer than 23 hours without them having to contact the embassy legally. So that they shipped me off pretty pretty quickly, and they, they did pay for my plane ticket to send me out. They tried to make me pay, but they need to always maintain this control of information. And when people start to break that control and get the truth out and expose the lies, then that's that's a real where they're vulnerable. So w what led you to write this book? In other words, this incident happens 21 years ago. What's been your journey in the 20 years since then that's led you uh, to write this book and make these documentaries? So after, you know, I, I studied art at college and, and there I really received this socialist indoctrination. And this is in Australia. This was, you know, 25, 20, more than that years ago. And I was, I, I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't identify it. Then, you know, I go through this journey and, and I, and I, I realize I, I, I have to, I have to be careful with what I educate myself with. I need to keep a broad mind. Um, because in that socialistic indoctrination, you're just so limited. And, so after having this experience with, with, uh, in China, I had been working already as a producer in video and, and education for, for quite a few years professionally. So I started to turn my skills to use it for, for good rather than, um, just for commercial purposes. So I took that turn and my husband's been fantastic to support me, uh, in my efforts there. And I made a documentary called Finding Courage, which is the, the one I mentioned as a, a family, a family story of surviving persecution in China under the communist regime. And they, as victims, they couldn't tell me why, why the state is so brutal, why the torture is so brutal and so cruel. So I had to, as a journalist, I felt it's my obligation to talk to some perpetrators and I didn't know how to find them, but I managed to. To some perpetrators, not to Correct. the victims only, but also to the perpetrators. And I so you're going understand. there. So when you did this now, were you an American citizen at this point? I was still an Australian, okay. but I was living here in New York. Okay. But you are, so you go to China to tell, uh, to try to tell the story journalistically. I mean, I'm amazed that anyone spoke to you. No, I did this from, I went to five countries, but not China. I was able to get undercover footage from inside China from a journalist contact there who risked his life to get me footage from the inside of a Chinese labor camp, which is in the movie. But my interviews, I had people from inside China willing to talk to me, but I had to say no because I just didn't want that. So this is a documentary us. called Finding Courage. And Correct. where can people find Finding Courage? Uh, you can find that on Epoch TV. You can find that on uh, findingcouragemovie.com. It's also on iTunes and a lot of other major platforms. It has received a lot of censorship, but that's just our day and age. So um, you can stream it on a lot a of your A lot platforms. of censorship. For, yes. From whom? I can imagine that the communist Chinese would want to censor it, but. Correct. And they control, they have a lot of financial ties throughout our major media institutions. See, this is, this is kind of, you know, the most important thing of all folks, you know, you think, well, I live in America. So you're telling me that they're amenable to pressure from the communist Chinese and that they will knuckle under and they will, for, for reasons of profit, for greed, they will say, we, we, we won't air 
something like this. Yeah, I, and really because I've worked in this space, China human rights for 20 years, I've seen it consistently through all the major media outlets. And it's encouraging that recently since the, the pandemic, people have been more aware uh, since we saw what came out from China uh, and that the, the CCP just lied directly. And, and then people started to actually see, hang on, they're, they're lying, point blank. Then it was a lot easier for a message like this to come out. Whereas I, uh, you know, really I've experienced that sort of censorship and this financial control through colleges as well. I've had colleges with my last movie that did air on PBS, um, colleges calling me saying, I'm sorry, we've had to cancel the screening of your movie because we have too many students from China and we will lose our funding from the CCP. Now, who, uh, what was the name of the, 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 the more recent film that you're referring to that was on PBS? Hard to Believe. And what is that yeah. about? Um, that's about the killing of prisoners of conscience for their organs in China. If you need a heart or a liver in China, it's still happening today. You can get one within a week or two. And it means someone has to be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, in China today, uh, if you stand against the communist atheist state, they will put you in a prison camp, whether you're a Uyghur Muslim or Falun Gong or Christian or anything, and they will then say, since they don't believe in the sanctity of human life yeah. or anything preposterous like that, that you're nothing, they own you. And if they could use any of your organs, they can kill you and they can take the organs. And they are literally doing that for profit today in China. They seem to have no idea of the satanic evil that they are propping up. It's an amazing thing. So the film that we're talking about now, the, the, this one is called Hard to Believe. When did that come out? 2015. Okay. So fairly recently, mm -hmm. and but it did air on PBS. Mm -hmm. That's That alone is astonishing to exactly. me. Exactly. We were really, f for that movie, I wanted to make sure we had distribution. We had a distributor confirm that they would be able to get a movie on that topic onto PBS. And we, we had about, we had more than 50% take up from the stations, which was pretty impressive. So PBS Around America ran this film, Hard to Believe, which is about what we've just described. And um, if somebody wants to see Hard to Believe today, where where can they find it? Can they find it on Amazon Prime? Yes, is that one you can get on Amazon. That's our, amazing. Our Finding Courage movie was censored. We've had a lot, there's been an increase in censorship. Um, uh, for a lot of a lot of conservative filmmakers in the last few years, and Finding Courage has been um, censored, but and film festivals as well. Oh my gosh, goodness! A lot of film. We've just had we've had film festivals saying we are so scared to show your movie because we know we'll lose our funding from China. Funding from China. Yeah. So for thirty pieces of silver, uh, it really is. It's an amazing thing that there are people that they say they believe in this or that, or they believe in, and and yet funding from China will get them. To say, okay, we're we're not going to run it. Thank you very much, Kay Rubicek. Just a joy uh, to get to know you. Thank you, and folks, the book is "Who Are China's Walking Dead." Kay, thank you. Thank you very much.